All right, everybody, welcome back to Introduction to U.S. Multicultural Literatures. This will be uh, a lecture on, uh, it, this will be a lecture that will introduce our final unit or our final chapter of the class as we uh, come to a conclusion. We're moving on into the 21st century, though we, we sort of have been in a, our last novel was Antelope Woman by Louise Erdrich, the first edition of which appeared in 1998, and then the second edition of which appeared in 2016 in her revision. So we've actually already entered the 21st century, but uh, we're coming down to the present. This has been a historical survey, and we're going to read two more poems together. I want to look at Marilyn Chin's How I Got That Name, and I want to look at Lorna D. Cervantes's Love of My Flesh, Living Death, and then I want to look at our final novel, Valeria Luiselli's Faces in the Crowd, which will bring us into a discussion about language and world literature, as I have here. And I also want to make an argument about, particularly with respect to Valeria Luiselli's work, that we are entering what I would think of as a neo-modernist period, that, um, that the late 20th century's postmodernism and its multiculturalism have in many ways in the last 20 years given way to successors that seek to get past these ideas. So I want to actually come back to this idea of neo-modernism and I want to explain the image and the idea of neo-modernism and the ideas about language and world literature in the next lecture. So I normally explain my illustration of my first slide when we start the poetry, but I want to actually hold off. I want to talk about this in the next lecture as a prelude to discussing world literature translation and Valeria Luiselli. What I'd like to do in today's lecture, and today's lecture might be a bit of a mishmash, a bit of a hodgepodge, a bit of a, a little of this, a little of that, because it's harder, the, the more you get toward the present as you undertake a historical look at literature and culture and art, the harder it is to talk about, because there's not a settled way of discussing these issues. So as you come to the present, you're sort of in, in the chaos of the present, and you have to sort of chart your own way through it, whereas the past, when something is in the past, it's easier to generalize about and to see, well, okay, these were the trends, these were the dominant ideas, these were the ideas that were coming up. But when you're in the present, it's all much more bewildering. There's a famous quotation for, for this from the philosopher of history, Hegel, H-E-G-E-L, and he said famously, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, and that's very poetic, but what does it mean? What it means is Minerva was the goddess of wisdom, and her owl would fly to impart wisdom to the philosopher of history only at the end of the day. So only at the end of the day, at dusk, as, as evening comes on, only then can you understand what the day has meant. It's much harder to understand the present. So, uh, so my exposition might be a little bit more, uh, or a little bit less, let's say, coherent than it's been, though maybe it hasn't been coherent all along, I don't know, but, uh, but it'll be a little bit less coherent. So in today's lecture, I wanna discuss a few of the trends in 21st century literature and culture that have, I think, been successors to postmodernism and to multiculturalism. And then I want to look at Marilyn Chin's poem, uh, How I Got That Name, in many ways as kind of the climax of our study of poetry over the course of the semester. Uh, it's a longer and a more complex poem, and I think it's a poem that in certain ways recapitulates some, so much of the poetry we've, we've read. It has modernist and postmodernist elements and multiculturalist and post-multiculturalist elements. And as such, I think is kind of a fitting note to end on. And then, but we will look briefly in the next lecture at Lorna de Cervantes's poem, Love of My Flesh, Living Death, as an instance of translation. So that's the itinerary. I'll come back to this image. I'll come back to this uh, to the, these ideas of language, world literature, and neo-modernism in the next lecture. For now, I want to think about some of the other ways besides what I will discuss as neo-modernism that 21st century writers have begun to think about what might come after postmodernism and what might come after multiculturalism in both literature and art and politics. So. In the literary and artistic realm, uh, 
there was a growing, I think, impatience with postmodernism. You'll remember that postmodernism posited a world in which everything was a cultural construct. So everything came down to the signs and images that circulated in a society that told that society what it, what it was, that told the individuals in that society what they were, and there was no deep truth beyond those signs and images. Everything was sort of uh, a matter of surfaces. And it was important that we understand that, said postmodernists, because that was a way of showing your distrust of the previous grand narratives that had uh, that had been dominant in the modern period, narratives of progress, of necessary cultural evolution, of all forms of culture and politics moving toward a great goal, toward an end of history. And the postmodernists said, well, these beliefs in progress, these master narratives, these grand narratives had tremendous casualties. That whether you're talking about the imperialism of the European states in the 19th century, whether you're talking about American racism and white dominance in you know the periods of slavery and Jim Crow, whether you're talking about fascism or communism in the 20th century, all of these ideologies posited some idea of the, the, you know, history had a total order and the dominant classes of these societies had access to that total order and everybody who didn't fit in, they enslaved, they dominated, they exterminated. And so we have to have this distrust in grand narratives. And that was what postmodernism basically was. And yet there is there, there is a cost to that idea, and we looked at the cost of postmodernism when we first talked about it, when we talked about the ways in which it related or didn't relate to multiculturalism. We said in certain ways postmodernism and multiculturalism are in agreement, they are in accord in wanting to displace previous dominant narratives, such as the narrative of white supremacy or European dominance or male dominance. And yet we also said there's a way in which postmodernism and multiculturalism differ. And one of those ways was that postmodernism, with its distrust of grand narratives, makes it difficult to stake any claim about morality, about justice, or about truth. If everything is just equally a cultural construct made in certain circumstances for you know, the benefit of somebody who was making it, but there's no deep truth to it, then that moral aspect of resisting oppression, which is part of postmodernism, gets lost. In a weird way, postmodernism can't account for itself. It's based on a moral idea, I think, at root, which is resisting dominant master narratives that are oppressive. And yet its way of resisting them is to say everything is culturally constructed, everything is therefore equally kind of relativistically culturally constructed. And so, um, and so in getting rid of the old master narrative, you make it difficult to say why anyone should believe in a new narrative or why anyone should have resisted oppression in the first place. There's a, a quality that some thinkers have observed of cynicism. And so I think that you know, in the 21st century, particularly even at the end of the 20th century, there were attempts in the arts to move beyond postmodernism, to create forms of art that would be able to make moral claims or truth claims or claims to beauty that simply, you know, that didn't just sort of dismiss everything as a, as a flat image. So two of these ideas are the new sincerity and meta-modernism. Um, I don't know why I have them in, uh, in the opposite order of the title of the slide here, but let's go from the bottom up. So the new sincerity was an idea that, 20, that early, late 20th and early 21st century artists across the arts, music, you know, cinema, literature, explored. Um, and I think a text that's often cited is the original Wikipedia entry for it in 2006 when Wikipedia was new. The new sincerity, though, was basically an idea that said, let's get beyond that postmodern cynicism and suspicion and create forms of art that do make overt appeals to the reader's sense of both emotion, 
and sense of morality. Um, you know, it, it takes on the postmodern idea that previous master narratives were, were false or were wrong and deserve to be superseded, but it says we can make new narratives, we can tell new stories, we can uh, have new forms of self-expression that make just claims to truth and morality. The problem was that prior claims to truth and morality were unjust because they were based on hierarchy, they were based on dominance. So sure, let's get rid of those, let's critique those, but if you make new claims, um, it's possible for them to be just. So to quote the original Wikipedia entry for New Sincerity, it privileges human connection and non-ironic expression of sentiment and concern instead of disconnection and lofty cynicism. So postmodernism was cynical. It was relentlessly ironic. It gave you no stable position from which to judge any value, any claim, any narrative. The new sincerity cuts through that, says let's have non-ironic expressions of sincere, earnest, honest sentiment and concern. It increasingly returns academic intention from the increasingly, so you shouldn't repeat a word like that, remember to proofread, uh, it increasingly returns academic attention from the increasingly deadening emphasis on social construction and the deconstruction of the soul to previously suspect topics such as beauty and aspects of the emotional life. So new sincerity makes an open appeal for the reader's emotion, for the reader's feeling. And I would say that, the, you know, there's been sincerity in much of the literature we wrote. I think there's a, you know, let's, let's think back to Antelope Woman. I think that novel has a postmodern quality to it. It's very metafictional. First of all, the narrator is a dog, and the, narr the dog narrator is always asking us to reflect on his act of narration. And it's also very postmodern in that the narrative is very abundant with stories, and they are sometimes very realistic, very earthy, very gritty stories, and sometimes they are very mystical, very magical, very spiritual stories, and these are put on the same plane. And I think that's the metafiction and the kind of relativism are aspects of postmodern culture. But at the same time, I don't think there's any doubt that Erdrich has a sincere um, motive in writing Antelope Woman and that the text itself has a sincere appeal to our emotions. It tells a very earnest set of love stories that I think we're meant to be moved by. It narrates the experiences of several characters that I think, you know, we are meant to sort of identify with and care for and feel for, and it makes certain open moral appeals. That moment when the characters share the Blitzkuchen, you'll again have to excuse my German pronunciation, and they sort of share in all life, uh, that's a moment where I think Erdrich is saying something very true uh, as she sees it. Uh, that I don't think it's something she feels cynical or ironic about, this truth that we all share, humans and animals all share in this life force that deserves to be honored. I don't think her critique of the Dawes Act of sort of capitalist relations displacing more communal and more individual um, indigenous sets of uh, values, I don't think that in any way is... Um, is, is, is cynical or ironic. So I think Antelope Woman is a good example of how the artistic innovations of postmodernism, its critique of prior grand narratives, can coexist with the creation of new narratives that we are meant to take as true, as real, as good, as beautiful. And so I think you can see a hint of new sincerity in Erdrich's book, not least because it sort of occupies these different time periods. It's a work in one way from 1998, but it was a work revised over almost 20 years and republished in 2016. So I think we can use, I don't think Erdrich would identify with the movement of the new sincerity. Some of the writers who would identify with that movement, um, I can just name a few, it would be um, Michael Chabon, um, David Foster Wallace, Zadie Smith, mostly writers we unfortunately haven't read in this course, um, though Zadie Smith would be an interesting writer to read in this course, I have to say, but there's uh, just only room to read so much. But I still think we can use aspects of Louise Erdrich's work as exemplary of the new sincerity. Metamodernism, 
is um, is similar metamodernism as the name would suggest. I quote from a manifesto written by Luke Turner, a, uh, a visual artist in 2011. He says, um, so he's not content with two isms. He introduces a third, which is romanticism, an ism we haven't even discussed in this class. But he says, we propose a pragmatic romanticism. Now, that's supposed to be an oxymoron because romanticism is a an idealistic uh, form of um, of ideology. And so, if you, you know, it's as if he's saying a pro pragmatic idealism unhindered by ideological anchorage. Thus, metamodernism shall be defined as the mercurial tr condition between and beyond irony and sincerity, naivete and knowingness, relativism and truth, optimism and doubt, in pursuit of a plurality of disparate and elusive horizons. We must go forth and oscillate. So that's, uh, that's a very enthusiastic piece of prose uh, that I'm not sure I particularly like. Um, first of all, if you're halfway between truth and non-truth, then you're, you're still in non-truth. But anyway, um, I, I come not to criticize. So the idea here, I think if we could put this more simply, is let's be aware of all the issues that postmodernism raised. The, of social constructionism, of the dangers of grand narratives. Let's maintain awareness of the of those critiques. Those those were very important, but let's maintain awareness as we go forth and create new narratives. So we're going to go forth and create new narratives, narratives we believe to be true, or beautiful, or good. But we're going to. That's the modern part. Where that's the that's the modernist idealist part. Remember, part of modernism in the arts was that you're getting to a form of truth by introducing multiple perspectives that were previously occluded, but you're going to be meta about it. You're going to be self-aware about it. You're going to always critique your modernist impulse to advance a new true narrative by reminding yourself of the truth of postmodern critique, which was that there's a danger in cultural constructionism in narrative advancement. I hope that's clear. It probably isn't that clear. I know all these isms are very confusing. They're actually not less confusing the more you learn about them. Uh, you just get deeper into the complexity. And so negotiating that complexity is, is what learning about them is. It's not that you ever um, fully understand anything, or at least I don't. Maybe some people fully understand everything and you should have taken their, their class, but, uh, but it's not me. So that's that. So that's at the level of, I would say, more the arts. These are, you know, Luke Turner was an, a visual artist or is a visual artist. The, the uh, exponents of the new sincerity tended to be writers, sometimes musicians and filmmakers. So this is a way of creating art past the point of postmodernism, an art that doesn't just rest with the constant ironic critique of itself, but advances some, some truth or some beauty beyond that. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about politics. And I, I mentioned that I think that in many ways multiculturalism was a movement that was very much a movement of the 70s, 80s, and 90s that in the 21st century has successors that owe to multiculturalism some of their values and instincts. But I don't know that I think multiculturalism, despite the fact that this course is still offered, is really the term that would be used for, for some of the movements toward diversity today. And so what I want to look at in this potentially controversial slide is I want to look at possible objections to multiculturalism from the left. And what I mean by that is we, when we first talked about multiculturalism several lectures ago, I mentioned that multiculturalism, when it really became a force in publishing and in academia in the late 20th century, it set off this culture war. And this culture war was between the right and the left. And so the left was largely identified with the multiculturalist position, you know, and with, I think, many aspects of the postmodern position calling former grand narratives of American and Western culture into question and advancing a pluralist perspective that would allow voices that had previously been marginalized op and oppressed into the conversation. Whereas the, um, the critique on the right, 
and I, I tried to phrase it in a way that wouldn't caricature it, and I'll try to do so again, was that by doing this, you risk fragmenting society beyond the, to the point where it's no longer a society at all. And if we don't hold on to some conception of, of transcendent truth. And now the right being, you know, generally I think if you're on the right, you, you, you adhere to some idea of tradition. Their idea was it's, it's dangerous to call into question some of these older ideals. It's dangerous to call into question certain religious or national ideals. And so that was the argument between the right and the left. That was the culture war between the right and the left. But I think what's become increasingly, and that, that persists, by the way, that culture war still exists. But I also think what's become increasingly visible in the 21st century is that there was always a debate about these issues on the left itself. And that debate was carried out in institutions that for various reasons were more dominated by the left than the, than the right, such as you know, the academic arts and humanities and the art world and the publishing world. So what is this, and, and in the political wings of the right, the Democratic Party in the United States or the Labor Party in Britain, these debates have heavily featured. So what are these political debates about multiculturalism and its legacy within the left all about. I think there's something that's something we need to talk about because they've only become, particularly in American and I think even British politics, more and more urgent and more and more um, sort of salient in the last decade. So I want to look at three objections to multiculturalism from the left. So they're not going to be that similar to the, the conservative objection to multiculturalism, which is that it, it too readily dispatched certain old ideals of America, of Christianity, etc., that we should retain. These are going to be very different types of critiques with very different priorities. So I have three possible objections to multiculturalism from the left. Why is the left in quotation marks, by the way? Because it's hard to define what the left or, or even the right is. Um, it's hard to define what multiculturalism is. I could have put it in quotation marks, too. And are these even objections? I could have put that in quotation marks. If there's one lesson of postmodernism, it's that you could put anything in quotation marks because anything is a cultural construct that has certain limitations inherent to it. So, uh, but let's 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 get away from my self consciousness and let's look at these three. I have three possible objections. Two of them. I would say are political, the third is artistic, and I have quotations from three writers that I think have advanced these arguments, and I'll also explain the image on the slide in a moment. So the first argument from the left is that multiculturalism is a separatist, relativist, and self-marginalizing ideology. So let's take these objections in turn. It's separatist because it says that you know to have multiculturalism you have to have the view that a society is composed of many different distinct and discrete cultures that to be cultures are bound off from one another so in that sense it says that multiculturalism has this ideal of kind of separatism inherent in it which is to say that you know well over here we have African Americans, and over here we have Native Americans, and over here we have European Americans. And these are separate cultures that don't really have much in common with each other and can only interact across certain boundaries. It's also a relativist idea, which is to say that it says that there's no way to judge practices um, that belong to one culture or another because all cultures are legitimate, all cultural practices are legitimate. But the objection to multiculturalism from certain left-wing standpoints would be, well, is this true? Is it true that we should never judge any cultural practices from a moral or a political perspective? What if, um, what if a particular culture, whatever it may be, Let's say, let's, let's look at it this way. Let's say you're a feminist and one particular culture, whichever, you know, just to, you know, uh, think of one, but I'm not going to name one, is heavily oppressive toward women. Can we not judge that? Is it not permissible to say this might be a problem? 
if this culture is heavily oppressive, you know, physically abusive toward women, um, is it not a problem if you're, let's say, a, a, a leftist from the point of view of economic inequality, and we can say, well, one culture is very hierarchical in its view toward, you know, the economy, and there's the rich, and there's the poor, and that's just the way it is. If you, you know, if you're a leftist, if you're, let's say, a socialist, can you not judge that? Um, so, uh, and I, that's an open question. I put it to you. I'm not, I'm not arguing either point. I think relativism, we started this class with relativism in certain ways. We said that at the end of the 19th century, with the collapse of certain religious and cultural ideals, it became hard to say that there's only one way to do things in the world. Uh, you know, it became hard for anyone to say that. And I think it's still hard and should be hard for anyone to say that. But at the same time, you know, it, that doesn't really end the conversation. I think that opens up the conversation because there's still things in the world that we might want to call injustice, that take various cultural forms in various places and in various communities. And so how do you negotiate dealing with that? And then the last claim I think is 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 an interesting one that it's self marginalizing. We've we've used a lot in this class the phrase you know marginalized voices, marginalized people, and part of the multiculturalist and the postmodern movement was was devoted I think to raising that idea of the margin. So let's I've used that phrase without really elaborating on it. It's a metaphor, and I think it comes. Imagine you know imagine. Um, a book and the print in the book is the text and then the the blank space to either side is the margin and the idea of being marginalized is that you're left out of the text you're left out of the story you're pushed into the margin and a lot of the postmodern and multicultural movements tried to say that that's actually in a way not a terrible fate because the text is that master narrative you want to critique. And so you don't want to be in the midst of the master narrative. You want to be outside of it critiquing it. So the margin becomes a place of honor. The margin becomes a place of great perspective. The margin becomes a place from which you can perceive more clearly than the center, than the text. And yet there's a way of there's a way in which that perpetuates the inequality it means to critique. You, you retain the division between center and margin, between text and margin, and you just say, well, before they said the text was great, before they said the center was great, but now we, we invert that, we deconstruct that to say the margin is great, the margin is where you want to be, but you retain the division, you retain the binary, and isn't that really, doesn't that run counter to an ideal in which to you want to end inequality. To end inequality, what you want to do is sort of abolish the division between center and margin, between text and margin, and bring everybody to the fore. So uh, my quotation to illustrate this, this critique is from a very interesting, very famous, very controversial 20th century thinker named Edward W. Said. So Edward Said was a Palestinian-American literary critic and political commentator, and he wrote a book that is one of the landmark works of the postmodernist and multiculturalist period of the late 20th century. He wrote a book called Orientalism in 1978, and this is one of the most influential works published in the humanities uh, in the 20th century. And in this work, Orientalism, he says that the approach that Western writers and thinkers and politicians have taken in the 19th and 20th century toward Eastern cultures, and his particular focus was on the cultures of Islam and Islamic and Arabic and Middle Eastern civilization, he said that it's been a discourse of domination and control. They constructed an image of what used to be called the Orient that they could control, and that's why they did it. They, they, this was a period of imperialism, and in order to exercise economic and sometimes military and political dominance over the countries and cultures of the East, 
they created a cultural image of the Orient, which allowed them, which legitimated their dominance and their rule. And you'll note there's two parts of this argument. One is very postmodern. The idea of the East that was had in the West was a cultural construct made by Westerners that had no inner reality. It was just a series of signs and images. And in Orientalism, Said exhaustively charts these signs and images. But there's a part of it that's not that postmodern in that it makes a counterclaim about truth which is the reason the West did this was for reasons of domination and control. They did this to dominate and control, mostly financially, economically, as well as militarily and politically, the East. And in that sense, their claims were false and their claims were wrong. So Said's argument is not really a relativist one. He says, you know, he says that the image created of the East by the West is false and wrong and you know and done for a discernible purpose and thus what we should do is move toward the truth not just deconstruct signs because everything is made of signs and we want to be free of the illusion that any sign is true no we should deconstruct this particular sign this particular image the orient in service of getting to a greater truth now Said was a very compl uh, complex writer. He went through different phases in his career, and he initially, you know, was more identified with the postmodern critique, but in his later writing, he died in 2003, he was identified more with saying, you know, no, I never meant to say that everything, everything is a sign, everything is an image. I was identifying this one particular cultural construct because it was wrong, because it was false. And actually... My aim as a writer, Said ended up saying, especially in the last decade or so of his life, my aim as a writer was to advance the cause of human liberation, of universal human liberation. You know, I'm not a postmodernist. Um, you know, I think he said that in so many words. I'm not a postmodernist. And so I want to quote from an essay he wrote in 1991 called The Politics of Knowledge, he says, marginality and homelessness are not, in my opinion, to be gloried in. They are to be brought to an end so that more and not fewer people can enjoy the benefits of what for centuries has been denied the victims of race, class, or gender. So Said sees marginalization as a way of denying genuinely good things to people on the basis of their race, class, or gender. And he saw his purpose as a writer to advance that universalism, to bring everyone into the, into the benefits of truth and of abundance. And so, you know, often his critique of literature for perpetuating Orientalism or other forms of racism was often took the form of a critique of hypocrisy. He would look at writers uh, famously you know, Europe, famous European writers uh, like G Jane Austen or Joseph Conrad, and he would say that their works are racist, they're exclusivist, and he would say that, in fact, they, they espouse a kind of universalism that they undercut with their own racism, and he praises the universalism. He says there is a greatness to these writers. He does, he's not just sort of a smasher of the canon or a, someone who derides dead white males or dead white females in Jane Austen's case. He says there's a genuine greatness, but it's undercut by this exclusivism. And he was always attentive to the two sides of, of, of great works. And so a very complicated writer. I recommend his books, Edward Said. You should read Orientalism and his other um, famous book, Culture and Imperialism. A very complex and interesting thinker, a very interesting life. So that's that. The next bullet point luckily is much more uh, easy to understand and that this is the one that's illustrated in the picture in my slide which is that multiculturalism might function as a diversion from a way of not talking about economic inequality and I'll, I'll read the quote first so the quote is from again an American literary critic and theorist named Walter Ben Michaels and he says, so the model of social justice that's held by, you know, a kind of multiculturalist perspective in his view, 
is that the rich make whatever they make, but an appropriate percentage of them are minorities or women. In other words, the idea here is that if mostly what you're talking about is race or gender, that becomes a way of not talking about class. So that the inequalities of a very economically unequal society can persist under the new legitimation that the ruling class is now diverse, that we've brought people from formerly oppressed or marginalized groups into the ruling order, and so it's now okay that they are part of the ruling class, that the problem was never inequality as such, it was just racial and gender inequality. And so if you, you know, bring some if the ruling class diversifies itself, you know, stops excluding people on the basis of race and gender, then its economic and political rule is then okay. And from the perspective of Walter Van Michaels, and I, I would also argue of Edward Said as well, this is wrong. This is a wrong way of looking at the issue. You can't just um, substitute racial and gender diversity for greater economic equality that has to be part of the conversation as well and my illustration is of the uh an advertisement from the united colors of benetton which is a clothing uh company a fashion company and they were one of the first companies uh in the 80s and 90s that made an appeal through diversity they very much made an appeal to the to the consumer by having diversity foregrounded in their ads. Their ads were always uh, featuring people from multiple racial, ethnic backgrounds, multiple genders and sexualities. And that was seen as progressive, and it obviously was progressive from the point of view of race and gender, though also it was still a pitch from a global corporation selling, you know, high-end fashion items. So it's, it, I think Benetton was often used as a symbol in left-wing critics of multiculturalism. They would, in their writing, they would use Benetton as a symbol of how a superficial appeal to diversity conceals a continuing perpetuation of economic inequality, which, by the way, these writers would be the first to emphasize generally um, you know, her economic inequality, no matter how much you've sort of diversified the top, will continue to hurt people of color worse, you know, at the at the lower levels of, of society's economic ladder. So it doesn't even it, it doesn't even achieve the goal of really ending racism. It just sort of um, it, it creates a kind of smokescreen behind which certain forms of economic inequality that are rooted in centuries of racist oppression would continue. So that's the second argument, that multiculturalism is a diversion from economic inequality. And then finally, the more aesthetic critique is that it lends itself to a didactic and academic approach to literature and art. So because so many of these critiques of the old dominant order were, as we saw in the lecture on multiculturalism, launched from within academia. Um, academia became sort of the, the social and cultural center of the critiques of racism and sexism. And so this created a way in which these critiques became very identified with academic language, with academic norms and practices such as collegiality, you know, everybody in academia has to have a certain decorum and respect with one another. And this went along with the institution of literary, uh, of creative writing as an academic discipline. So writers uh, of whatever background who used to be sort of outside of the institutions of culture, uh, you know, writing, writing from a position of freedom are now academic professionals. And so their writing has to be collegial has to adhere to certain academic norms and also there's a kind of didactic quality that that literature that is sort of multiculturalist uh, always has to make kind of a point it always has to make a to sort of tell a, a fable against discrimination you know so to speak it always has to come down to some to some moral moral goal and as we learned we you know what the essence of modernism is 
was to reject didacticism. And I would even argue the essence of postmodernism in its endless ironic critique of all cultural constructs is also a rejection of didacticism, of preaching, of teaching a moral lesson. And so multiculturalism on this view sort of became equated with a a view of art that was completely institutionalized within academia and thus cut off from the very people it purported to to help marginalized groups, oppressed groups. You know, it's it's important to remember most people in the United States don't go to college. I think the statistic is something like 30 30 percent of people go to college in the United States. And then when you start talking about who gets a graduate degree, you're getting into much more rarefied strains of society. And so there becomes this issue where the you know these critiques of racism and sexism and oppression are are coming from a group of people that by its nature is something of at least intellectually speaking a a an elite and so who who are very cut off from the people on on whose behalf they claim to be speaking the oppressed the downtrodden the marginalized and so this creates a literature that is didactic and also sort of false it's also sort of cut off from a from a from a from a living language um, that's the critique i'm not saying that's true but i'm saying that's the critique and so one recent writer who has made such a claim is anish shivani uh, a Pakistani American writer, poet, literary critic, cultural commentator. And he wrote an essay called Notes on the Ascendancy of Identity Politics in American Writing. Um, as we saw, identity politics and multiculturalism are sometimes used interchangeably, it's sometimes used differently. It's very complicated, but he's using it to mean what I'm calling multiculturalism here. And he says, this is perhaps a debate where academic collegiality is incompatible with imaginative writing, which most would agree is nonconformist, solitary, often opposed to community or citizenship or even responsibility, and in general driven not by any optimistic political agenda, but by darkness and light in equal measure. So I don't, I don't actually know if most would agree to what he proposed there, but, uh, but you'll hear an echo there of what we saw in Philip Roth, the idea that the writer is an individual telling you know, his or her truth and is not somebody whose main goal should be to speak on behalf of a group or to speak on behalf of a moral position. And for Shivani, identity politics or multiculturalism inevitably puts writers in this position. It puts them in this position where they're expected to be somehow exemplary, somehow... Um, you know, the voice of, of progressivism, and he sees this as, as false to the mission of the writer, which is to give a much more independent uh, and subjective report from their own sensibility. And like I said, these I'm not, you know, telling you these things to endorse them. I'm telling you that these debates have only become more and more visible on the left or in institutions that are dominated by the left in the 20th in the 21st century or whether that be you know debates in the democratic party between a uh, a, a, a socialist and a reformist perspective or or whatever so i think that you know understanding these debates understanding this culture war not just between the right and the left but within the left itself um is I think important for understanding the 21st century. There's a culture war within the right itself too, but that's not um, something we're going to discuss. I mean, this is kind of a touchy subject, but uh, I don't know how to put it. Human the arts, the, the academic arts and humanities is, I don't think there's any reason to just avoid saying this because it's true. It is an institution generally dominated by people of a generally left of center sensibility. Um, and I think that's also true of, of mainstream literary publishing and of the major sort of small presses that make up literary publishing. We can have all sorts of discussions about why that's true or if it's a good or a bad thing, but for the most part, it is true. Um, and the debates that are happening on the right tend to be taking place elsewhere, sometimes elsewhere in academia, you know, in, in economics departments or in political science departments where I think there's a bit more ideological diversity. 
Um, but you know, for that reason, that's why it's not really something that's on my slideshow. I hope that makes sense. I'm just trying to be uh, perhaps overly bluntly honest about that. Um, we can talk about whether that's a bad thing or a good thing or what, but I do think it's the state of affairs. So that's that. And I wanna move on now to considering in the last, let's say, 15 minutes of this lecture, Marilyn Chin's poem, How I Got That Name, because I think this is a poem that, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, brings almost all of our discussions so far to a climax. It's a poem that is in many ways very modernist. Uh, it's a poem that seeks to um, sort of, just as modernist literature often sort of plumbed the depths of the unconscious, I think this is a poem that tries to express the, the, the depths of the poet's psyche and family history in this very probing way that I identify with modernism. I think it's also very postmodernist in that it puts so many different cultural allusions into conversation with one another. And the way I've put it, I've, the way I've presented the poem on my slide is almost with footnotes. I've explained certain allusions and what they are. I think it's also a poem that is on one hand multiculturalist it is it's a poem very much it's about immigration it's about a kind of culture uh the meeting of cultures in the life of marilyn chin who experienced both chinese and western cultures in her you know in her upbringing as the child of immigrants but i think it's also a kind of post-multiculturalist poem in the way in which i think there's a certain mockery in it of how multiculturalism um, sort of commodifies difference, commodifies um, non-Western or, or non-white identities into just another, just another kind of item in the marketplace and the consumer marketplace. So I think it's a poem that, that raises so many issues. And also it's a very much a feminist poem. It's a poem about, um, about, a, uh, about the experience of a woman in a patriarchal society or, or kind of in, in two patriarchal societies. So I think the best thing to do is just kind of read through it and, and elaborate on some of its allusions. So Marilyn Chin, how I got that name. I am Marilyn Mailing Chin. Oh, I love the resoluteness of that first person singular followed by that stalwart indicative of B without the uncertain ING of becoming. Of course, the name had been changed somewhere between Angel Island and the sea when my father, the paper son in the late 1950s, obsessed with a bombshell blonde, transliterated mailing to Marilyn, and nobody dared question his initial impulse, for we all know lust drove men to greatness, not goodness, not decency, and there I was, a wayward pink baby, named after some tragic white woman swollen with gin and nembutal. So let me just pause there. It's a long poem, so I want to pause um, at, at each of the stanzas. So we have the, uh, I think the brilliant way it begins, I am Marilyn Mailing Ching, and then it undercuts that by ironically saying, I love the resoluteness of the first person singular followed by the indicative of B without the uncertain ING of becoming. So what's ironic about that? What's ironic is she says, I am, and then she says, actually, uh, you know, I love, and this is, it's not even just irony, it's, sci it's sarcasm. She doesn't love. She, oh, how I love. Uh, but she doesn't love. She hates. She hates the fact that she's limited to the singular pronoun because she, as, uh, as Walt Whitman before her did, contains multitudes. And she also hates the is the the you know am is a, is a is a version of is she hates that because she's not just one thing she's becoming multiple things through time and what this poem is is a is a kind of guide to all the many things that that she is and that she is that she has been and is becoming this is a poem that argues on behalf of the of the plural and of the of the progressive so then she gives you 
uh, she gives you a little bit of her history. The name had been changed somewhere between Angel Island and the sea. So Angel Island was an immigration station near San Francisco. It's sometimes referred to as the, um, the West Coast version of Ellis Island because in the kind of mythology of American immigration, Ellis Island off the coast of New York is where the European immigrants tended to arrive uh, to America from, but an Angel Island in San Francisco tended to be the immigration station where immigrants from, from Asian countries tended to come through. Um, and her father is a paper son. So a paper son is, uh, these are people who were born in China who immigrated to the United States under false uh, pretenses by purchasing documentation, uh, forged papers, which stated that they were blood relatives to Chinese American citizens. Because the idea was, you could immigrate to the United States if you were a relative of someone who was already a citizen. So a paper son was somebody who had false papers stating that they were a relative of someone who was already a citizen. So she's giving you these, and you know, nowhere are these allusions explained in the poem. One of the ways in which this is very much a poem of the multiculturalist era is you're expected as a reader to just catch up if you don't know these if you don't know all the many historical and cultural allusions this poem is giving us, you're expected to look it up, to do your research, to you know, to become to become a multicultural citizen, aware of the plurality of the cultures around you. And then the then she sort of criticizes or mocks her father for giving her the name Marilyn. So she was born Mei Ling, and her father. So there's a tradition in many different immigrant communities, including my own, of anglicizing your name, of trying to assimilate into American culture by turning the name you were born with, which, you know, was presumably in accord with the language you were born with, into something that sounded more like an Anglo name. So just for instance, my, uh, my immigrant grandparents were Orlindo and Nunzia, and in the United States, they went by Tony and Nancy. So that's a very common practice in many different immigrant communities. And so I think she's referring to this practice of her father wanting to give her a name that would be assimilable to the English language. So he turned Mei Ling to Marilyn. Now, why did he do this? Well, he named her after Marilyn Monroe, who was a 1950s celebrity and actress and model who died of a drug overdose, Nembutal being a, one of the prescription medications with, to, uh, to which she was addicted. Um, and her father named her this because of his lust for this famous American model and actress. And so she's, one of her strategies of irony throughout the poem is saying, uh, saying, you know, of course the name had been changed. We all know lust drove men to greatness. So she often refers to what we all know. And her point is that what we all know is something we should call into question. What we all know is wrong. Of course, the name had been changed. Well, why, why of course? Why should we accept that people have to change their names to become part of American society? Um, we all know lust drove men to greatness, not goodness, not decency. Well, yeah, we all know. Why should we accept that? Why should we accept that men are motivated by lust and not by morality? So this is part of her constant strategy of sort of sarcasm throughout the poem. She alludes to, to common sense that she wants to call into question. We shouldn't accept that everyone has to change their name to become part of American society. We shouldn't accept that men are... Uh, are dominated by lust and can't do otherwise. Okay, moving on. My mother couldn't pronounce the R. She dubbed me number one female offshoot for brevity. Henceforth, she will live and die in sublime ignorance, flanked in loving children and the kitchen deity. While my father dithers, a tomcat in Hong Kong trash, a gambler, a petty thug, who bought a chain of chop suey joints in Piss River, Oregon, with bootlegged Gucci cash, nobody dared question his integrity, given his nice, devout daughters and his bright, industrious sons, as if filial piety were the standard by which all earthly men are measured. So in this stanza, she is paying sort of a tribute to her mother, who refuses to be complicit in her father's lust and assimilation by not calling her daughter Marilyn, but also 
I think that idea, she will live and die in sublime ignorance flanked by loving children and the kitchen deity, in quotation marks. So the kitchen deity is the most important part of a plethora of Chinese domestic gods that protect the home and family, which if you look it up, that's what it says. That's literally true. But I think she puts it in quotation marks in order to make fun of the way in which certain cultural and immigrant experiences have been commodified in multiculturalist literature. That a lot of commercial multiculturalist literature that's not, from Marilyn Shin's point of view, very good, none of the stuff we read falls under that heading. And I, I wouldn't even want to dare to name the thing she might be talking about. But the way in which these texts and, you know, movies and books have sort of commodified the immigrant experience, commodified the Chinese-American experience, so that, you know, now everyone knows about the kitchen deity and everyone knows about certain, you know, the, the cuisine, you know, prepared by immigrant women in kitchens, that this has become kind of a cliche. And I think she puts it in quotations and refers to her mother's sublime ignorance, which is not what her mother possesses. Her mother understands what her father was doing and was very wittily making a joke about it. Um, so this idea of immigrant women living in sublime ignorance and cooking wonderful ethnic meals in their kitchens, you know, I think this, she, this is a cliche, a stereotype. It's a, you know, a quote unquote positive stereotype that probably replaced a negative stereotype, but it's still a stereotype. And I think that's what she's making fun of. Meanwhile, she goes back to her father, for whom she seems to have, have a certain distaste, and refers to him as merely a petty criminal and, who's laundering his criminality through the respectability of his children. And that brings us to the next part of the poem, where she tries to refuse to be this, both on gender and racial grounds. So let me read it, and then let me explain what she's getting at. Oh, how trustworthy our daughters, how thrifty our sons, how we've managed to fool the experts in education, statistic, and demography. We're not very creative, but not adverse to rote learning. Indeed, they can use us. But the model minority is a tease. We know you are watching now, so we refuse to give you any. Oh, bamboo shoots, bamboo shoots, the further we go, we'll hit east. The deeper down we dig, we'll find China. History has turned its stomach on a black polluted beach where life doesn't hinge on that red, red wheelbarrow. But whether or not our new lover in the final episode of Santa Barbara will lean over a scented candle and call us a bitch. Oh God, where have we gone wrong? We have no inner resources. So I don't actually understand the second half of that stanza, but I do understand the first half. In the first half, she's refusing to be two things. One, she's refusing her father's demand that she just be this good girl whose daughterly obedience will make him respectable in the eyes of society. She doesn't want to be that. She, she wants to be a much more complex, much more unpredictable, much more mercurial uh, person. So that's number one. Uh, she's refusing the father's demand that she be a certain thing as a woman. She's also refusing American society's demand that Asian Americans be a certain thing, which is called the model minority. So the model minority is, again, this kind of positive stereotype, quote unquote, but nevertheless a stereotype, which says that Asian Americans... Um, so the basic idea, it's not even just limited to Asian Americans. There are certain, the way that American racial ideology kind of sets different um, groups, whether of people of color or of immigrant groups against one another, is by praising certain of those groups for having assimilated, for having done well in school and made a certain amount of money. And then it uses that as a kind of weapon against groups that remain, um, again, we're, I'm talking about sort of just big, big picture, that have remained in many ways economically disenfranchised, often because of legacies of racism. And so you might uphold certain communities, the Asian American community or the Jewish American community, as model minorities, as groups who have um, assimilated into American life through academic and economic advancement and then turn around and say to other groups who remain 
um, in the aggregate more at an economic disadvantage and you say well why couldn't you do that why couldn't you do what they did and Marilyn Chen I think recognizes this for the trap that it is that Asian Americans and other model minority quote unquote groups are being used against other groups whose economic and cultural disenfranchisement is part of a history and part of a legacy of racism. So she refuses to be part of that model minority. She refuses to sort of conceive of herself as a Chinese American in that way. And when she says we're not very creative but not adverse to rote learning, one of the things she's pointing out is that the model minority stereotype about Asian Americans that claims to be a positive stereotype actually rests on an older racist idea that was very negative. And this goes back to the 19th century. 19th century European, you know, writers on race would say of, you know, they would sort of create hierarchies of races and they would try to make sure the European was always at the top. And they would say that, well, the... Um, this was back when they used the term Oriental, which Edward Said, you know, it was, was instrumental in, in having us recognize as an offensive term. They would say, well, peoples of Asian descent are next in the hierarchy after Europeans because they're very, they're able to learn well. But the reason they're inferior to Europeans is because they don't have the spark of creativity that Europeans have. And so this was the racist stereotype that was used in the 19th century and Marilyn Chin is saying well the model minority myth actually st rests on the foundation of that stereotype this idea of Asian people as um, as sort of you know able to be academically inclined in a kind of mechanical way so she's refusing these two demands she's refusing the racist demand of you know sort of white dominated american society that she fill the stereotype of the model minority but she's also just as we saw louise erdrich would often in her you know antelope woman would often point to the way that certain native americans were complicit in the oppression of the native american community at large marilyn chin similarly accuses her father of being complicit in this because her father is making a very similar demand more on gendered grounds that, he, that her, his daughter is supposed to be this very well-behaved young woman in order to shield his own poor behavior, his own criminality. So she's refusing this. She doesn't want to be this. And then, then in the, the second half of this stanza that I don't quite understand, there are three allusions that I think are very interesting. One is to Santa Barbara, which was a soap opera popular in the 80s. So an item of popular culture. And then there are two references to famous American poems. Uh, William Carlos Williams's Red Wheelbarrow and John Berryman's one of his dream songs in which he talks about having inner resources. And so I think the interesting thing there, though, is that whatever, whatever the thing about the polluted beach means, and I'm not sure I understand, uh, Nevertheless, she's showing that she both places herself in the tradition of American poetry, that she can quote Williams, that she can quote Berryman. She sort of takes her place as an equal among these famous sort of male poets that went before her. And she also shows that she can put, you know, popular culture on the same level. So she's conversant with the monuments of modernism, which Carla, William Carlos Williams' poem very much is, and she's conversant with popular culture. And that way, this is a postmodern poem. It contains multitudes. It puts these things on the same level. And then um, she ends the poem by sort of talking about, she makes a final declaration. I'm actually going to skip the next stanza and just go to the last one. So here lies Marilyn Mayling Chin, married once, twice to so-and-so, a Lee and a Wong, granddaughter of Jack the Patriarch and the brooding Su Lin Fong, daughter of the virtuous Yuet Kun Wong and Gigi Chin the infamous, sister of a dozen, cousin of a million, survived by everybody and forgotten by all. She was neither black nor white, neither cherished nor vanquished, just another squatter in her own bamboo grove minding her poetry when one day heaven was unmerciful and a chasm opened where she stood like the jowls of a mighty white whale or the jaws of a metaphysical godzilla it swallowed her whole she did not flinch nor writhe nor fright 
nor fret about the afterlife, but stayed, solid as wood, happily a little nod, tattered, mesmerized by all that was lavished upon her and all that was taken away. So I think this last stanza is kind of an extravaganza of this poem's sort of uproarious tone, this poem's audacious, uh, boastful tone in some ways, in other ways self-undermining, self-deprecating. She gives herself her own epigraph. She gives herself her own eulogy. She humorously imagines herself swallowed up by the earth, which she likens both to a famous um, American icon of high culture, the white whale, Moby Dick, uh, the whale in Herman Melville's classic 19th century novel, but also to Godzilla, a popular culture monster from Japanese movies. So she's combining East and West. She's combining high culture and low culture. And she characterizes herself as this sort of outsider to American society. She says she was neither white nor black, which I think in certain ways reflects her sense that the American way of thinking about race is so dominated by um, by by the division between white and black Americans that people who don't fit into either category are a little bit of outsiders to that discourse, except as they may be manipulated in it, as, as in the model minority myth. Um, but also she talks about, uh, she you know, she says she did not flinch nor writhe. She stayed in the afterlife. She's sort of happy to be not part of the center. So this is maybe the attitude Edward Said was criticizing, but she's adopting, which is that the margin is a great place to be. It's the best place to see what's wrong with the center, whether that be the center of the Chinese American family, the patriarch that is the father, or whether that be the white dominated center of American culture, manipulating, um, manipulating people of all racial groups and ways against each other. So she sort of declaratively places herself in that, that marginal position. She stays in the afterlife and she will be the poet mesmerized by all that was lavished upon her and all that was taken away, all the many multitudes of things that she is and continues to become. And in that way, I think this poem, which contains so many multitudes, contains so much, I think, of the issues we've talked about in this class before and so many of the poetic values that the poets we've read before have advanced. So I think that's a wonderful note on which to end this lecture. I will join you for the next lecture for a discussion of neo-modernism, translation, and a beginning discussion of Valeria Luiselli's novel, uh, Faces in the Crowd. Thanks very much and have a great day.